I'm sure this is not new to anybody, but essential tremor is the most common uh, movement disorder. Um, incidence is about 10 times that of Parkinson's disease. And uh, people shake when they move. And um, it is a neurodegenerative disease. People used to call it benign essential tremor, but it's actually not so benign. And um, in terms of treatment for it, uh, there are medications, propranolol, primidone. Uh, most people respond to it, but only about half the people actually take it long term because of side effects. Uh, there's some second line drugs, but uh, topiramate, gabapentin, those don't really work. Um, along with the uh, tremor, people uh, will have cognitive changes. You get frontal subcortical di um, dysfunction. Uh, it's pretty similar to Parkinson's, uh, but not as severe. You have gait and balance changes, and uh, mood disorders like anxiety are, are pretty common. Um, so, in terms of Oh, you know, this is a Mac. It's probably not going to, none of my videos are going to work, are they? Yeah, maybe. Okay. So in terms of why we do DBS for tremor, you can see this is pretty, this could be pretty debilitating if every time you reach out this is what it's like. Um, this gentleman, if you ask him to touch his nose, you see him actually close his eyes because he knows he's going to lose one if he, he doesn't. So it's kind of, um, yeah. So in terms of previous treatments for essential tremor that were surgical, um, Actually, if you look back far enough, people would do cortis cortisectomies, like they would take out motor cortex. That was uh, a treatment people would use. Um, but uh, in the 50s, Irving Cooper was doing a pedunculotomy for tremor treatment and uh, took the anterior choroidal artery. Uh, the guys uh, basically gave the person a pallidotomy, and his tremor got better. And people started looking at deep brain structures to uh, lesion. Um, this is a diagram from a uh, chapter by George Ogerman uh, in Art Ward back in 1967. Um, and, and looking at uh, targets in the thalamus for tremor, and basically we use the same ones today. So um, if you have an ultrasound, gamma knife, you're still aiming for these basic same areas. Uh, but we have either sort of the superior ventrolateral thalamus kind of uh, just above VIM um, or VIM itself, uh, fields of Farrell kind of in the preliminal radiations, sort of posterior subthalamic region. Um, and these all work fairly well for tremor. And in fact, if you just look at how well it works, it's the same as DBS, it's the same as gamma knife, these, all these uh, radio frequency targets. Um, I just like this picture because it was before levodopa. And I see them at conference every Wednesday, which is funny. Anyway, so um, the dogma of how DBS works is that you have high frequency stimulation and it mimics these ablative techniques. Um, in terms of input and output from the cerebellum, what you're trying to target is that uh, sort of just anterior to VC. Um, you can also target sort of more uh, direct uh, um, uh, projections to the SMA, like VOA, VOP. Uh, but sort of the standard is um, that, that VIM region. Um, in terms of what a deep brain stimulator looks like, we have an intracranial lead. It's connected via an extension uh, in the neck to a pulse generator. Um, and this uh, allows programming, so you can make adjustments, you can turn it off. Um, in terms of the sort of most common uh, implanted system, it's, it's from Medtronic. Um, this is just a, one, of the, one of their leads, but there's four contacts. Uh, it's fairly narrow, so it's 1.2 millimeters, not uh, too huge. Um, the electrodes are separated by a certain distance. And, and again, with different systems, there's different uh, lengths. Uh, but what you're looking at, basically, each contact site can be on or off. And you can use a bipolar configuration, uh, monopolar. You can try guarded, you know, different combinations of these. Um, in terms of the generator, you have uh, this implanted uh, device that basically, for, for, for all of the systems right now, at least, they just deliver the square wave. So it's actually. Um, it is biphasic, but the recovery is, is a, sort of a natural recovery, so they don't uh, uh, make it a, a real uh, biphasic wave. Uh, in terms of what it can deliver, it can amplitudes up to 10.5 volts. And the Medtronic system is constant voltage, which is weird, but it's because they based it on cardiac stuff that they had. Um, you can see the pulse width rates and things like that. So there, there are certain parameters that you can change. Um, in principle, like thousands of combinations, in practice, there are some limits because uh, they're not going to be all that different. And on average, about three to four years for these uh, non-rechargeable devices. Um, in terms of how they work, so kind of just returning to this guy. I don't know how to go back here. Um, so with DBS, you can get people significantly better. So um, 
hey, look, he's not going to lose an eye. So this is a pretty uh, good therapy that people have worked out pretty well how to do, fairly low complication rates, it's well tolerated. Um, other people are getting into the game, so St. Jude's has a directional lead where you can supposedly steer current um, off axis. Boston Scientific has similar hardware. Um, people are looking at this 40 contact electrode, actually Medtronic just killed that, but they, uh, people are looking at different things to try to improve this, even though just in general, so we know for Parkinson's, DBS works better than just best medical management. For essential tremor, there's no randomized control trials, but, or I shouldn't say that, I guess there are, but there, there are no um, good <laughs> randomized control trials showing efficacy, but we're not gonna stop using it, right? Um, so what we've done is just kind of gone from these non, large non-specific lesions like a big cortical resection uh, or, or pedunculotomies that give you a, a neurological deficit to these smaller specifically targeted uh, lesions in the thalamus itself that are irreversible. And now we're doing these sort of reversible targeted lesions and, and we're looking at ways to adjust that. So that, that's sort of the progress of where, where we've been. Um, in terms of what we're doing next, uh, Right now, deep brain stimulation, you have a set of parameters and you just kind of leave things there. And on one hand, that's nice because it's simple. Uh, on the other hand, you do need to see a neurologist or your nurse practitioner to make changes. Um, and again, patients can make some changes with their, with their patient controller, but it's not really that convenient. Um, the, the thought behind trying to make an uh, a closed loop DBS system is that we want to respond to patient physiology. So the point of doing this is not just to, to do a reversible lesion, but to try and recreate basal ganglia loops. Um, in order to do that, uh, some of the major article, so it's funny actually, so closed loop stimulation in cardiology has been like around for over 50 years, like 1963, right? Nobody's tried to do the same thing for the brain. Part of the reason is we're not sure uh, what brain signals mean. Um, and the second is uh, we don't know what disease brain signals mean. So, uh, and, unlike, and unlike the heart where it's fairly simple to get it to start in terms of stimulation parameters, what you'd want to change for stimulation is not clear for the brain. So, so those are the major challenges. Um, in terms of why we would bother, people's symptoms do change over time. Um, and so, uh, you know, for, for example, just in, in Parkinson's, you take your medications, your symptoms get better. If you leave your DBS at the same setting, you might get dyskinesias. So th th things like that, um, where your treatment's not adjusting to the amount of uh, symptom control you need, that uh, can be problematic. Uh, for patients with essential tremor, um, there is this thought that people develop tolerance over time. Um, and while that's still controversial, you, you do see patients who it works great for six months, they come back in, and for whatever reason, it just doesn't seem to do it anymore. You, ask, you change the settings, they get better for a while, they come back and say, okay, it worked for two weeks. And so, um, and for some of those people, I tell them, just turn it off at night, and it seems to last a little bit longer before they come in, but they still get, seem to get this tolerance. Um, with the current batteries, and I know there's new ones coming out that might change this, but having stimulation on when you don't need it, it's just a waste of battery. And again, it is surgery to replace them, and so you're exposing them to that, you know, one to three percent chance of an infection, which would be an explant, and so that's it's a small risk, but it's not insignificant. Um, and then the last thought is there are some side effects to stimulation, um, especially like essential tremor, you get gait instability, dysarthria. Um, sometimes people do want a bit more stimulation for particular activity. And they know that, yeah, you know what, if I turn it up past this, I'll get dysarthria. But you know what, maybe for that short period of time, I don't mind the dysarthria. You know, if I'm eating, I'm not going to be talking. So why don't we turn it up? And so you can do that manually, but it would be nice if uh, perhaps to give patients uh, an easier way to do that, uh, to trade side effects for efficacy. And so those, those are the motivations. In terms of what a system like this looks like, um, there's a little control diagram. But basically what you need is a surrogate marker for the benefit of DBS. Uh, that could be a brain signal, it could be a smartwatch that you wear that's detecting tremor. Um, and then you have this control loop where you have a state estimator that says, okay, well, you're doing well, you're doing badly. Um, you match that up with sort of a, a, a table of like, okay, well, when you're doing well, this is what the, the machine should do. You do that thing, you sense the, um, the output uh, with whatever sensor you're using, and you kind of keep going with that loop. And, um, kind of has two sides to this problem. So one is sort of a neurophysiology problem. What signals are we looking for? What does it mean to have a good result from deep brain stimulation? Uh, and the rest of it's engineering. So how do you respond? Um, and so, so that's kind of the two uh, things that we're, we're dealing with. Um, 
our control, our, our closed loop simulation uh, system right now, we are using the Activa PC Plus S. Um, this allows sensing from implanted electrodes, and so you can implant a cortical strip, you can implant two deep brain leads, um, but the important thing is that you can get data from those implanted uh, sensors. Uh, this also can stream to a controller, so what we're using is it's called the Nexus controller, but basically it's a telemetry device that will stream the data. And you can Bluetooth it to a phone or a laptop, um, and uh, we've, we've done both of those things. Uh, we are also kind of using, so in terms of sensors, you can have external ones, internal ones. Uh, for, for most of our experience, we do use uh, inertial sensors in EMG, uh, partially for um, therapy and then partially for or just like, you know, knowing what's going on. Um, our trial right now is for essential tremor and what we're just kind of looking for in terms of our aims is, okay, can we reduce battery usage by 20% by just shutting it off if somebody's not using it? Um, we've looked at, again, these wearable sensors and ultimately we'd like to use a neural signal. Um, and we have some objective measures and, and we can, you can measure the amount of stimulation delivered from the device. Um, but uh, it's really more of a proof of principle than anything else. Um, this is kind of going to go over that. So uh, I, I just have some data from one of our subjects. We've got four implanted. Um, but our first subject was a 58-year-old gentleman. He had right grid and the left uh, tremor. Uh, you can see his Fontelis and Merit scores are, he's not too bad, um, but he kind of falls in that moderate uh, category. Um, so we implanted on the left. Uh, you can see the cortical strip there, kind of overhand motor cortex. Um, and in terms of just our experimental setup, we have a smartwatch that he's wearing, we have an EMG sensor, and then uh, we use the Nexus D and the laptop for control algorithms. Eventually you can get all this stuff on board, uh, but right now we're still using these, um, the, the, the communication with the laptop. Um, just during one of our, our experiments here, the, uh, the upper bar is just him uh, as the inertial sensor, so every time he moves his arm you see a big spike. Um, you can also see the tremor signal, there's a better one um, later. Uh, we also have these uh, surface EMG uh, markers that we're using to uh, just kind of corroborate the, the gyroscope data. Um, but uh, so, so what we have here is uh, a couple of different strategies to deliver stimulation based on his symptoms and based on data from these external sensors. Um, so the, using the smartwatch, we can get a good estimate of, of the amount of tremor that he has. And what we're having him do here is just bring his hand up to his mouth because that gives him tremor and then lower it again. Um, if you look at the tremor estimate, so when he has no stimulation on, you can see uh, that blue line, okay, a fair bit of tremor. And you can tell when he's moving his arm. Uh, with the DBS on all the time, uh, when he's moving his arm, when he starts to move it, you'll get this artifact. And so it looks like he has tremor, but really that's just when he's starting and stopping the movements. Uh, that third group is uh, what we call the, like this tremor modulated um, approach where we have a sort of, we set a threshold and say, okay, well, if the smartwatch is detecting this amount of tremor, let's start ramping up the stimulation. Once it, if, if it's gone, we can lower it. Um, and so you're, you, you see the, that red line down there is how much stimulation he's getting. Uh, and it does go on and off every time he moves his arm, uh, but it doesn't go all the way up to his therapeutic setting. Um, and you can see that he does have a bit of tremor because if he's not having any tremor, the device isn't going to turn on at all. So, so that's, um, we call this tremor modulated uh, approach. And the last um, group there is, is what we call movement trigger. And, and there we're just using the service EM EMG and saying, look, if the you know, three to six hertz band goes above this threshold, just turn on the device. Uh, and there we're just looking like, look, if you're moving, you're probably going to have some tremor. Let's turn the uh, DBS on. And you can see the, the estimated amount of tremor is much lower for that. And again, those big sort of spikes when you start, it's, it's most likely just as he starts moving, uh, you get this big broadband thing in the inertial uh, sensing. And so it, it's, it's probably more artifact. Um, just in terms of the metrics for these two um, approaches, uh, using the IMU, so using the smartwatch, um, you save uh, about 84% of your stimulation power. So it's on a lot less. Um, in terms of how much tremor, so compared to always on, you have about 40% uh, less control. So it's not terrible. You save a lot of power, but you, you do have more tremor. Um, with the EMG uh, modulated thing, you have, um, you use about half as much power. And then uh, with the tremor, 
how much tremor you have compared to it being always on, you only have about 8%. So um, you get much better tremor control, but you don't save as much power. Um, and that power saving, obviously, for this, for that, is going to depend on how often you're having a move, right? So we had a moving half the time, so basically we saved half the power. Um, but uh, what we did notice is that, okay, so, I mean, it seems obvious in retrospect, but if you're going to try to stimulate based on some symptom, you're going to have to have some amount of that symptom before you can trigger stimulation. So it's not going to be as effective. Um, interestingly, the, our, our subjects uh, don't seem to notice that it's worse. So if you ask them, hey, which one seems to work better, if you let them have a little bit of tremor, they still say, eh, you know, it's, it's pretty much like having it always on. Um, the nice thing about this is if you have, um, I mean, we could in principle do this for people who with just regular Activa PCs right now. So um, that technology is out there. Um, in terms of using the movement to trigger, yeah, you still have extra, extra stimulation that you probably don't need. Um, but at the same time, um, you, you still save about half the amount of power or however much you're moving. Um, if you think about it, as long as you turn it off when they're asleep, you're going to get 33% savings probably, and that's going to beat our goal. So um, that's kind of reassuring, sort of nice uh, data, and, and kind of informed what we tried to do next, um, which was cortical control. Um, in terms of principles behind this, if you look at voltage changes over particular parts of the brain, uh, they do reflect uh, overt and uh, imagined behavior. And using this data, the frequency content of that voltage uh, signal can be used uh, it, sort of differentially. You get different spatial distributions. So high frequency um, uh, band power changes tend to be fairly localized. Um, but uh, something like the beta band, uh, it's pretty widespread. So you move your arm, you see that over a fairly large portion of the brain. Um, and they're kind of in opposite directions. So as you move, uh, you get beta desynchronization, so your beta peak drops. Um, on the other hand, you get this rise in broadband gamma power. Um, and using that, uh, we, we've used that for, for controlling uh, brain-computer interface devices in the past. Uh, and our thought was to try to do this with the DBS. Um, so again, the, the, um, the, this uh, PC plus S system, you can hook it up to basically a resume, an old resume 2 electrode from uh, Medtronic spinal cord stimulation. Um, and you can record that. Um, in the past, when we've done things, you know, you get an epilepsy patient in long-term LTM doing LTM. You can run experiments for a week, maybe two weeks, um, and then you got to take everything out, right? So, it's, but these folks, we've had uh, people in, uh, implanted for over two years, and the signals are stable, and so that's um, one of the benefits of, of, of using this system. Um, in terms of how we process these signals, just uh, this is sort of a simulated voltage tracing uh, from an ECOG electrode. Uh, you can see there's different frequency components, so. Um, there's a sort of slow change in time, a little bit faster, there's a really fast change, and then there's this faster change that itself changes with time. Um, if you add them all up um, and sort of just look at how much of the signal change is responsible uh, or, or, or is, um, is because of these frequency components, you can get a, a, what we call a spectrogram. But basically we're just saying the slow movement usually contributes this much to the signal. Um, and uh, if you take s short windows of the signal and kind of just slide it through time, make these little spectrograms, uh, you can um, get a sense of what each frequency component over time is doing. And so here you can see there's a, a faster moving segment of the signal that increases in amplitude, uh, and there's a slightly slower that decreases. And that's kind of what you see when somebody initiates movement. Um, and this is just sort of real data. So uh, here we got a... Uh, the smartwatch is hooked up so you can tell when he's actually moving his, his hand or his arm. Um, and, and this is their signal from our DBS device, uh, the cortical spectrogram. So in that sort of 20 hertz-ish region, you'll see when he's at rest, there's more signal. And then as soon as he starts to move, that drops. Um, and that estimate of that power band down at the bottom, it, it, it's pretty pretty robust. And you can imagine that if, if we just took, if we just drew sort of a, a line halfway, we could have a, a pretty easily determined threshold and say, look, when, when the beta power drops below this, let's turn the DBS on um, and, and see what happens. Um, again, these stable, we've had stable signals, and this is just a, another picture of that. But you can actually differentiate hand and arm just based on how much it drops as well. Um, so yeah. Uh, above the threshold, uh, turn it off. Below the threshold, turn it on. Uh, one thing we noticed is that um, deep brain stimulation actually or 
alters your cortical electrophysiology. So if you have effective DBS, you'll actually see already a drop in beta power, drop in theta and alpha, um, and you get this other rise in uh, gamma. So that red line is, you can see with that big peak at 140, that's where we were stimulating him at. So that's what the uh, stimulation, and if you think about what it looks like when your brain's moving, it looks actually pretty similar. So that's a little bit of a confound if you're trying to use spectral features to uh, turn this on and off. Um, what you can do is you can manually tune this threshold. Say so, like, okay, well, looking at these two spectra, uh, let's try to aim to, for a point where uh, we won't falsely turn it on. Um, that's pretty easy to do, and you know, you drag and drop and stuff like that. It's pretty easy, but it's kind of ad hoc and aesthetically displeasing. So we have other ways of doing it. Um, but even with this sort of uh, approach, we um, have a, a couple of interesting results. So. Uh, Looking at two different types of movements using this, uh, one is this sort of prompted movement where you say, okay, hold your hand up, and we know his hand shakes. Uh, and the other is just to go through the whole FTM tremor rating scale and have him do those motions. Um, this is sort of just a summary of what happens in general. We Again, we have that smartwatch on. Those red lines say, okay, that's when the DBS is on. Um, the second is that tremor estimate. And again, you can see um, as the patient's moving, we get less tremor. Uh, the beta band estimate that we're using to trigger, it's kind of the fourth uh, box down. And so, so this was during um, writing tasks. So have him pick up the sheet of paper, put it down, start drawing his spirals. Um, you know, he'd take, take a break and switch the paper out. You can see it turns on and off as he's moving. Um, and then uh, during prompted movement, uh, obviously it's gonna be turning on and off. And this is kind of just a, a, a summary of every time he moves, what happens. So with no stimulation, uh, if you look at the tremor, uh, for each of these periods you can see, yep, he's got a pretty about, a good amount of tremor there in that uh, second row. Uh, you can see the beta band power changing when he, as he's moving. Um, and again, we don't have any stimulation with it on all the time. You still get those little kind of artifacts when he initiates and stops the movements. Um, with the closed loop case, um, we're basically seeing as, as he starts to move, you see a little bit of tremor, and that's pretty much when the, the DBS is ramping up. Um, and as he stops moving, that kind of goes away. Um, important thing, sort of this uh, bottom right box here. Um, the, all of these uh, red dotted lines everywhere are quartiles. Um, and so basically uh, around five seconds you see every single time we do a task he does get stimulation and so while it looks like that that it, it's kind of a, a curved uh, it's not as nice it's not like a nice square wave it always goes on because we do ramp it on and off but um, every single time it goes on so th this pretty simple algorithm does pretty well at detecting it to, regardless of what kind of movement he's doing um, just in terms of how well it kind of works. So pre-op, this was his spiral. He has four months, he uh, has a little bit of a lesion effect, which you know I'm not gonna complain about. But um, in terms of open loop and closed loop stim, um, every time I have to check and make sure I didn't accidentally put the two, same two spirals up, but they're, they're pretty much indistinguishable. Um, again, we turn it on every single time. One thing that is interesting about this is turning it off and on, you have to, um, kind of titrate it up, because again, if you just go from zero to two, most people will uh, kind of fall out of their chair or you know, you, you get these paresthesias. Um, and the way we set this up, there's some communication delays. So it does take about a second and a half for the DBS to go all the way up to uh, his therapeutic levels. Um, and that's something we're working on. In terms of next steps, we're again, trying to figure out ways to do that threshold without having to manually tune it. Uh, and we're working on getting this on board so that the communication delays are less. Um, and then, uh, I mean, there's lots of stuff we're working on. But um, in terms of the machine learning stuff, we have uh, about four subjects now, actually. This is just showing three. Um, but you can build these patient-specific. They're very simple, like linear discriminant uh, models. Uh, just saying, look, check to see if the stimulator's on. If it is, then this is, these are the set of uh, weights to use, looking at the spectra to turn it on and off. Um, and we just show, I just showed these three because you can tell like these are basically spectra, the blue and the red are spectra, and then the, the black line is the, is the model that this uh, comes up with. But they're, they're fairly different across subjects. And so what we're doing is just kind of tuning our thresholds to the individual. 
Um, and this takes about 20 seconds of training for the device. It's pretty simple. You just have them raise their hand, put it down, do that about 10 times, and, and the, the device can um, uh, come up with these. Um, in terms of how it works, uh, they're pretty well. So there's just a video of this, the, this type of movement that we've been doing. Uh, with this particular patient, because it's very reliably eliciting his tremor, you can see his hand starts to shake there, and the device gets told to go on, and it does. Um, again, that black line is the, sort of the tremor estimate. The red line below it is the DBS being on, and um, that's uh, the stimulation going on and off. So uh, in terms of how well this works, um, with these three folks, we had our neurologists look at video and do FTM ratings, so we went through the whole Fontalos and Barron scale with them. Uh, videoed it, had blinded clin uh, raters, and basically between on and off closed loop, you'd think that with this sort of initial shaking that it would be pretty obvious, and I think if I look carefully I can tell, uh, but our neurologists actually for, for two out of the three patients thought the closed loop, um, rated the closed loop uh, system better overall. Um, and part of that was that their ipsilateral tremor scores were lower. So there may be something where if you're turning this on and off that you actually affect the, the ipsilateral side more than you normally would, which is a little weird and we don't know why, but um, other people have reported some, some things like that. Um, we didn't do a condition where we just turned it on and off at random. That would have been probably the best thing to do. But um, so, so in terms of how well it works, uh, it works at least as well in these three folks as their uh, regular DBS. Um, in terms of other things we're looking at, uh, again, seeing that sort of odd drop in spectral characteristics um, when the DBS is working, uh, we did do some sort of, it's not really sham stimulation, but we did stimulation at ineffective sites where we would still see tremor, and you actually don't see as much of that drop. So this is sort of an interesting cortical marker for successful DBS that we could potentially use to help um, tune these devices um, sort of uh, more automatically. Because if you think about it, if you, if you try to use that Sapiens lead, it's got 40 contacts on it. If you're, are you going to sit there and program 40 leads? No, you're probably not going to want to do that. What you could do is uh, just titrate um, to this uh, using these two markers. So it's interesting. The gamma band power actually goes up. It's actually a very specific peak that's half the frequency of your DBS, um, which uh, they've actually seen for Parkinson's as well. For uh, They have this dyskinesia peak, so Phil Starr's group. Uh, if you're having dyskinesias and you have DBS and you turn the DBS on when you have dyskinesias, you'll see this really distinct peak at half the stimulation frequency. Um, and we sort of see the same thing with essential tremor. So there's some entrainment going on in that, in that uh, high gamma band that's interesting. It's funny, it's, I, you don't see this intra-op. Um, so I don't know if it's a stun effect or something like that. It's not an artifact of the, of the stimulation because if you... Um, do in, in ineffective stimulation, you don't see that peak anymore. So uh, that's that's kind of interesting. It's something that we're using. Um, so I think I think that's all I have time for. I went a little bit over, but um, this is just uh, the folks I'm working with. Wanted to reach out and thank them and see if you guys have any questions.